So in an earlier video, we have seen that if you have a specimen and we are choosing to draw our specimen as cylindrical rod, but they don't have to be. In fact, you know, they could be a rectangular cross section rods as well, something like this. Uh, and you have the tensile, you know, load applied at two ends. The only thing that will change when you write the definition of sigma is how you compute the cross sectional area A. So in this case, the cross sectional area would be the cross sectional area of this face. Uh, normal to which this force F is applied. Okay, so if let's say this dimension is L, this dimension over here is W, then the cross-sectional area here is equal to L times W. Okay, now if you were applying the same force in this direction perpendicular to this face, okay, then you would be looking at a different uh, value of uh, normal stress. So let's call this one sigma and here is another force F2. Let's say this is F1 and F1, so that's F1 actually here then the sigma 2 which develops due to this force F2 over here would be equal to F2 divided by a different area A2 that would be this cross sectional area. So let's say this is L, this we have already seen is W, then in this case A2 is equal to L times W. Okay, and this is, let's say this is A1 over here. So you have to be careful about which cross sectional area you are computing um, the area of, okay? Otherwise, you will get the wrong answers. And the cross section area that you pick will be the plane that's perpendicular to the direction of the uh, force that is applied on it. So coming back to our uh, specimen, so let's say we have this force F applied at the end. It's a tensile load, but it could be compressive load as well. That's not important. So in this case, we have seen that the stress is defined as F over A and the strain is defined as delta L over L. And we also have a way to compute the transverse direction contraction or, or elongation depending on whether it's a tension or, or compressive force. Um, but let's say we want to find out what happens when we increase the force F and how the elongation changes as a result of it, right? So we want to study, you know, force versus elongation in this case. So, so if you plot, let's say, you know, force on the y-axis and uh, the length of the, uh, let's say it's not the length, it's actually the, the, the actual elongation on, on the x-axis. So we want to see what happens when the force increases. What is the effect on the elongation? For most of the material, at least up to some extent, you'll find that you will have a pretty linear plot. Okay, so as the force increases, the elongation increases too. Okay, up to a certain extent. Beyond that, that wouldn't happen. Now, this kind of plot you will get for a certain geometry. So if you pick a particular length and you, you pick a particular, you know, cross-sectional area, let's say A, you will get this kind of plot. Now, if let's say I make my specimen to be, you know, longer than this, okay? So instead of, you know, uh, length L, I have actually my specimen that's twice as long, okay? Twice as long. So this is 2L, same material, same force, same cross-sectional area, okay? But the difference is that now it's twice as long. You can tell intuitively that in this case, when you apply the force and you continue to increase the force, you will actually experience more deformation compared to this case over here. Okay. And you can kind of visualize that, that as well. If you take a piece of rubber band and you apply tension at two ends and you continue to pull it, a longer rubber band will pull more compared to a shorter rubber band, right? So for a case like this, you might see that for the same force, you have a longer elongation. So you get a plot like this, right? So same force. So we have the same force, let's say applied here and corresponding to the same force F, you know, here is the elongation for, you know, one case and here is the elongation for the other case, right? Now you could also talk about a shorter rod. So instead of picking a specimen of length 2L, which is twice of what you had before, let's say we have a specimen that's only half as long as before. So here is F, here is F. Now this is actually L by 2. In this case, you can kind of intuitively see that when you apply the force, the elongation is going to be lesser compared to the case when the length of the rod was actually L. So in this case, you might see that your force versus elongation graph looks something like this, okay? So depending on the geometry that you pick, now you could also play with the area. So you could have, you know, a, a specimen which had larger cross-sectional area. In that case, you will be somewhere in this region alone, okay? So you will be somewhere here. Uh, this could be another plot for another kind of uh, uh, specimen. Here could, you know, this could be another one. 
you could have something like this for even a longer and a, and a thinner rod, right? So you have all these different force versus elongation plots. And this is the kind of area for rods that are stubby, right? You know, that are shorter. So let me write that shorter and larger area, right? So larger area, you know, area here, over here is cross section. And these are the sort of the plots for longer plus a smaller cross-sectional area specimens. Okay, so, so that's fine. We have linear plots for different kinds of geometry, but they're all made of the same material. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have some sort of plot that could be just one plot for a given material? Now, if you plot stresses versus a strain, okay you plot stress versus strain corresponding to all of these different uh, uh, plots that you see for different geometry you actually find that there's only one line so for one material different geometry doesn't matter whether you have uh, length l or 2l or l by 2 or l by 3 or you have cross-sectional areas a or 2a or a by 2 different geometry made of the same material if you plot sigma versus epsilon stress stress versus strain so here is my stress and here's my strain you find that you actually have a single linear plot, which is a very nice result because this means that instead of worrying about force versus elongation, which gives you a different plot for different geometry for the same material, for the same material, we can get rid of the de this dependence on the geometry by doing a sigma versus epsilon plot. Now, we have linear relationship here, we have a linear relationship over here, right? Which means that we can write that F is proportional to delta L in this case. Right, so we could also say f is equal to some constant of proportionality times delta l. This is called Hooke's law, named after Robert Hooke, who actually gave us to this law. So to some extent, most of the material actually perform actually perform like this. They they behave like this. And you would recall that when we discuss the forces, we talk about the nature of the forces, and we discuss a, a force called linear elastic force. We had a similar relationship. Right, so which which is telling you that most of the material actually do behave to some extent like a spring, even though they don't look like you know helical coil spring or whatever. But there is a sort of a linear relationship between the forces applied versus the elongation that results from applying it. And this this uh, factor k over here is called Hooke's constant. Hooke's constant. All right, now. We have a similar linear relationship for sigma versus epsilon plot as well. So we can write sigma equal to some constant times epsilon. And the constant that we actually choose is called E. And the E is has a definition is called Young's or elasticity modulus. Elasticity modulus. The reason it's called elasticity modulus is because if you apply a certain amount of force within a limit so let's say this is the limit of this graph okay so if you stay within that limit which means that you don't increase the forces beyond a certain point and what that threshold is we will talk about then if you release that force that the specimen is going to regain its shape so we say that it's actually elastic so some, when something is elastic that means that when you let go of the forces the object wants to regain its original shape instead of being permanently deformed okay so E over here is called Young's or elasticity modulus. Now, can we find E? Sure, if we know sigma versus epsilon, then all we have to do is find out what the slope is, then we know E is equal to 10 of theta, right? So knowing the stress versus strain plot, we can actually find out what the Young's modulus is. Now, let's see what else can we do with this particular equation over here. We already know the definition of sigma. Sigma is defined as F over A, and epsilon is defined as delta L over L. So if we substitute those two things, we get F over A equal to E times delta L over L, okay? So we can write this as F equal to E times A over L times delta L, right? Now, if you compare this equation with this equation over here, Right? If you compare it with this, then you can see that the k over here, that constant proportionality, is equal to E times A over L. So if you know E, the Young's modulus or elasticity modulus, 
and you know the cross-sectional area and the original length, you can actually find out what that constant should be for you.